Well, the committee will come to order. I want to make a couple of brief announcements. First of all, it will not be a breach of decorum with the current temperature if people remove their jackets. Uh, I apologize, but when they turn from air conditioning to heat, they do it with a vengeance in this building. Uh, I understand that the chairman has to leave at 1.30, so we will be respectful of time. Uh, as members show up, they may or may not get to ask questions. Uh, Madam Chair, I understand you are the only one that is going to be making an opening statement, correct? And then, Ms. Cross, I understand we get to keep you for all the follow-up questions. Well, very good. I am going to waive the normal mission statement and, uh, and be very brief in my opening statement. Today's hearing is, in fact, about the issue of capital formation. Uh, as the chart behind me indicates, the, the historic public market, the market we think of as the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, and so on, is no longer producing the number of initial public offerings as it once did. Since 1991, we have seen that avenue for capital uh, formation reduced. It doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of companies who, sh who still suit that. But today, we are asking the question of, can America continue to build companies of the future if there is not an additional access to capital for those companies of the future? Particularly, we will be asking the question of whether or not a 499 uh, limit of investors on private companies is appropriate or whether there can be administrative or legislative fixes to that. As a member of a board of a small public company, I am well aware of the cost and difficulties of being public. We are not the Financial Oversight Committee, and we will not assume that we can micromanage what happens in Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, or any of the other legislation that is well known here on the Hill. Rather, we are thrilled to be uh, in the presence of a distinguished first and second panel that are going to help us understand, in the broad sense of the word, word where America is going and what the great stories of tomorrow are. Many people have looked at the Facebook situation and said, ha, ah, that is the impetus for this. It, nothing could be further from the truth, although it is a high-profile company who only recently went past their 500 uh, investors. It is very clear that that is not the model for which we have a concern. We on the committee are concerned for the small and medium-sized companies, for companies in which a family or an extended family wish to make sensible plans for the future, uh, allowing diversification and, at the same time, opportunity for investors. Additionally, we would like to understand better from Chairwoman Shapiro what the real future of a qualified investor is versus the investment public as a whole. As all of us know, the SEC has a dual mandate. One of them, of course, is notably the protection of the public. The other is, in fact, what the hearing is about here today, which is capital formation. We hope to uh, come into this and go out of it with the idea that America has an obligation and Congress has an obligation to participate in capital formation that leads to greater employment. And with 9 percent unemployment still lingering with us uh, for over two years on and off now, we understand and realize that this is but a small element of it, but it is an important element. With that, I yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing will examine ways to help small and emerging businesses gain access to additional capital to help them grow and hopefully succeed. This issue is critical to the continuing economic recovery and future success of our great nation. If United States firms cannot grow, they simply cannot create jobs. Our examination must begin with a simple concept that permits our markets to function effectively, and that is investor confidence. If people or institutions do not have confidence that a market is safe and sound, they simply will not invest. And this lack of confidence 
will impede the ability of growing companies to access much needed capital. This was a key lesson of the 1929 market crash. As a result, Congress created the Securities and Exchange Commission to enforce security laws in a way that enables firms to access capital while providing investors with sufficient information to have a basic level of confidence in the system. We learned this lesson again in 2008, as inadequate financial oversight led to recklessness, fraud, and unscrupulous behavior resulting in the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression. We must never forget that. The SEC has now charged 66 entities and individuals with securities violations leading to or arising from the recent financial crisis. For example, Goldman Sachs paid a record penalty of $550 million after the SEC charged the firm with defrauding, and I quote, defrauding investors, defrauding investors by misstating and omitting key facts about a financial product tied to subprime mortgages, end of quote. Charles Schwab paid $118 million to settle charges regarding misleading statements the firm made to, to, to market a mutual fund, quote, invested in mortgage-backed and other ris risky securities. As a result, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Act last year, making critical changes to the U.S. financial regulatory system to enhance accountability for banks and Wall Street firms that caused the financial crisis. Some people now argue that we should repeal these protections in their entirety, as if the crisis that crippled our great nation and our economy in 2008 never happened. In my opinion, that is exactly the wrong approach, and as a matter of fact, it is shocking to the conscience. We will not restore lost confidence by removing protections that safeguard investors. Instead, we must find an effective balance. And I thank Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Shapiro, Chairman Shapiro for constantly talking about balance, one that ensures investors that they will be protected in the future while carefully examining ways to optimize growth. I fully support helping U.S. firms access additional capital. But I also believe that this must be done without sacrificing critical protections that assure our fellow citizens that our markets are fundamentally sound. It is important to remember that the investors we are trying to protect are everyday Americans. They are our constituents. In fact, according to an April survey by Gallup, a majority of Americans, 54 percent, reported owning some form of stock. I am I'm encouraged by the fact that since she has begun her tenure, Chairman Shapiro has taken an active role in guiding her staff to conduct comprehensive reviews over a range of issues concerning capital market formation, including many of the issues that we will discuss here today. The 25-page letter she sent to the Committee on April 6, 2011, demonstrates that she is serious about exploring innovative and new ideas to assist market participants while implementing robust consumer protections that will help investors retain confidence in our markets. In that letter, she, say, she say, said the following. Cost-effective access to capital for companies of all sizes plays a critical role in our national economy. Regardless of the form or size of the offering, companies seeking access to capital in the United States market should not be overburdened by unnecessary or superfluous regulations. At the same time, all offerings must, of course, provide the necessary information and protections to give investors the confidence they need to invest in our markets striking the right balance between facilitating access to capital by companies and protecting investors in our rules and, order, and, and orders is a critical goal of the SEC. And with that, I look forward to hearing from the chair, chair lady and our other panel, panelists. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. All members will have seven, or seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We now go to our distinguished panel. The Honorable Mary Shapiro is Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and Ms. Meredith Cross is the Director of the SEC's Division of Corporate Finance. Pursuant to the rules of the committee, I would ask that you both rise to take the oath. 
do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Would the record indicate that both witnesses answered in the affirmative? Uh, again, uh, Chairman Shapiro, we appreciate your making time for this hearing, and you are recognized. Thank you. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today on the topic of capital formation. As the Chairman has said, I am joined by Meredith Cross, Director of the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance. And I regret that a change in the committee's schedule for this hearing means that I do have to leave at 1.30 for a longstanding prior engagement. However, Ms. Cross will stay to address any questions the committee might have. Facilitating capital formation, protecting investors, and maintaining fair, orderly, and efficient markets is the mission of the SEC. Cost-effective access to capital for companies of all sizes plays a critical role in our national economy, and companies seeking access to capital should not be overburdened by unnecessary or superfluous regulations. At the same time, while we have an important responsibility to facilitate growing companies' access to America's investment capital, we must balance that responsibility with our obligation to protect investors in our markets. Too often, investors are the target of fraudulent schemes disguised as investment opportunities. In fiscal year 2010, offering frauds, cases where promoters, issuers, or others defraud investors in the offer of securities, comprised 22 percent of the Commission's cases. Investor confidence in the fairness and honesty of our markets is critical to the formation of capital, and the protections provided by the securities laws are critical to large and small company investors alike. Over the years, the SEC has taken significant steps consistent with investor protection to facilitate capital raising by companies of all sizes and to reduce burdens on companies in making offerings. From the introduction of shelf registration in the 1980s to the reduction of the eligibility threshold for shelf in the early 1990s to modernizing communications and the offering process in 2005, the SEC regularly considers and, when appropriate, implements changes to our rules to reduce regulatory burdens while maintaining the important investor protections provided under the Securities Act. The SEC also has undertaken efforts specifically designed to facilitate capital formation for smaller companies by simplifying the regulatory environment for them. Most recently, in 2007, the SEC adopted a variety of rules impacting small business capital raising and private offerings, a number of which were based on the recommendations of the SEC's then-serving Advisory Committee on Smaller Public Companies. Among the rules adopted by the Commission were those that simplified the disclosure and reporting requirements for smaller companies and expanded the ability to use less burdensome scale disclosure to more companies, allowed a company to grant stock options to more than 500 employees without triggering the requirements to become a reporting company, and liberalized the eligibility requirements for certain short-form registration statements and shelf registration to allow eligible smaller public companies to benefit from greater flexibility and efficiency in accessing the public securities markets. Recently, I instructed our staff to take a fresh look at our offering rules and to develop ideas for the Commission to consider that would reduce the regulatory burdens on small business capital formation in a manner consistent with investor protection. Areas of focus for the staff will include the restrictions on communications in initial public offerings, whether the general solicitation ban should be revisited in light of current technologies, capital raising trends, and our mandates to protect investors and facilitate capital formation, the number of shareholders that trigger public reporting, including questions surrounding the use of special purpose vehicles that hold securities of a private company for groups of investors, and the regulatory questions posed by new capital raising strategies. In conducting this review, we will solicit input and data from multiple sources, including small businesses, investor groups, and the public at large. The review will include evaluating recommendations of our annual SEC Government Business Forum on Small Business Capital Formation, as well as suggestions we, have, we receive and have already received through an email box we recently created on our website. In addition, I expect our efforts to benefit from the input of the new Advisory Committee on Small and Emerging Companies that the Commission is in the process of forming, which will provide a formal mechanism for the Commission to receive advice and recommendations about regulatory programs that affect privately held small businesses and small publicly traded companies. Any rule proposals that result from this review will, of course, be subject to a public comment period in advance of any rule changes being adopted. 
We look forward to working closely with Congress, the investing public, and members of the business community as we explore the possibilities and challenges in these areas and work to fulfill our mandate to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. We would be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, will begin by a round of questioning. Madam Chair, the uh, chart behind me, which indicates uh, a peak and then a, a pretty large drop-off uh, to where now 100 to 150 IPOs is considered a good year, does that indicate to you that the market for large companies, those who are over, mostly over 200 million that are doing IPOs, is in fact a market of the past? Or is it a recognition that it simply costs more to play in that market and those companies are choosing other alternatives? Mr. Chairman, I think, um, I think the, the numbers reflect a number of different factors that actually go into the decision um, that companies have to make about doing an initial public offering. Certainly, economic conditions are very prominent in that decision-making process. Um, there are also issues about whether founders want to give up their decision-making control that they exercise as a private company, whether they want to um, have a dilution of their ownership interests. Um, there is a potential disclosure of vital business information when you go public. Um, and I don't want to interrupt you unfairly, but all of those things existed in the 1980s and 90s. So the change can't be those factors. It could be consideration of those factors. But the real change in small companies going public since the 80s seems to be the cost of going public. I think cost of going public is certainly a factor. I do think there, there are, as I started to say, and I um, would be happy to supplement the record further, there are lots of factors, I think, that go into that decision for public companies, and including um, uh, um, some of our earlier IPOs up there, I suspect, represent foreign companies going public in the U.S. markets. And one of the things we have seen, particularly in the last several years, is a real maturation of foreign markets that give those foreign-based companies a viable alternative to going public in the United States, which I think is a perfectly um, rational decision for them to make. These are markets that are now liquid, have good listing standards, have sophisticated shareholder bases that they may not have had uh, 10 and 20 years ago, as represented by that um, chart. The other thing I think is, is important when companies, foreign companies make a decision about whether to access the U.S. IPO market is that um, it is much less expensive in terms of underwriter fees um, in Europe than it is in the United States. It is about a 4 percent gross spread in, the, in Europe, whereas it is a 7 percent in the United States. So right. but isn't I think it also there are lots of factors. Isn't it also true, though, that you have U.S. companies choosing to go public overseas in, in many cases, thus leaving a lot of your oversight behind? It is not just companies that are truly based overseas, but often companies who, are, who want to be global, whose CEO is, uh, is living here, who decides that an, a foreign market in Canada or in Europe uh, makes more sense for them to do. I think uh, I can take this. I think, I think there are some companies in that situation, but I think our, our data, which we are happy to supplement for the record, um, doesn't suggest that there is a significant number of, of U.S. companies um, going offshore for their IPOs. I think other factors um, that are relevant, certainly we understand that costs are important, and we are committed to looking at those costs. But I think that, um, for example, the alternative of a, of a sale um, increased significantly in recent years uh, and has more certainty. Mm. And so if people are trying to get out of their investment, the private equity market became quite huge in, in the last decade, and so that also provided an alternative. But this isn't to suggest we don't think the costs are important. I just think there are people have, have told us there are a number of reasons why companies choose not to go public now. Well, let, let me take a slightly different line, and, and I know we want to talk about small businesses and the 500 cap and so on. But let me just, just ask a question. When, when people want to float, if you will, public debt, senior debt, and, and they go through a process of registering debt, it is really a one-time event. You register the debt, it is floated, it is bought up, and then after that, the, the company that borrows $150 million in senior debt, in fact, it, it views itself as separate from the debt that it repays. To a great extent, don't we have a, a disconnect in that a company can say, well, look, I would like to take on investors, I am willing to tell them this, but I would like to be able to have 
the ability to run my company with those investors understanding at the time they bought in, if you will, what will or will not be reported. To a certain extent, haven't we lost that middle ground in, uh, in the public market? You are either all public and you have several million dollars cost to go public and uh, several million a year to be public, or you are private and you find yourself not availing yourself to, if you will, a broad range of, of investors. I guess I would, I would ask Meredith if she wants to add to this, but I think that's, that's basically right. If you choose to become a public company, you need to follow the reporting and disclosure requirements of the Federal Securities Laws. Um, you have taken investors' money. Um, that's part of the bargain um, that you have struck with investors is that they will have the opportunity to vote for board members, to participate in a meaningful way, and that they will have access to information on an ongoing basis that will allow them to make decisions about whether to continue to hold that stock um, or to sell it uh, in the market. Well, and, and the reason I asked that question was since we are not getting the IPOs here in the U.S., people are choosing not to go into that market, at least for institutional qualified investors. Why in the world would we have a 499 cap on how many of them can participate in a company? If you are a sophisticated investor, why couldn't you choose to be involved in what today is available to these leverage organizations and angel capital and other investors who choose to buy a bigger piece rather than one five hundredth? Mr. Chairman, that is exactly what our review is really looking at, is whether um, the threshold of 499 or 500 um, is still appropriate, as well as um, a review of the threshold at which a company can cease being a reporting company because of the change in the number of its shareholders. And um, We will, um, as you know, do a, a very rigorous study and gather the kind of analysis and data that is necessary for us to analyze whether those um, uh, thresholds are still appropriate um, given um, how markets are operating today. Thank you. I recognize the ranking member. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Shapiro, I want to thank you for your responsiveness to this committee. It has been extensive, uh, and I want to thank you and your staff. Um, and it has been forthright, and I really do appreciate it, and I, I think all of us appreciate it. There has been a lot of discussion about rolling back the protections Congress put in place to safeguard investors and the public. We hear that they are too burdensome, too costly, and that they hurt corporate profits. But I would like to return to the fundamental reason we need these safeguards to begin with. On January 25th, there was an article in The Atlantic. And it described in detail how executives from Bear Stearns took extreme measures to defraud clients, cheating, cheating investors out of billions of dollars through a corrupt, quote, double dipping, unquote, scheme. Amazingly, the article also reported that many of the very same executives, those responsible for these abuses, abuses are now in top positions at other firms. Here is what the article said, and I quote, Former Bear Stearns mortgage executives who now run mortgage divisions of Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Ally Financial have been accused of cheating and defrauding investors through the mortgage securities they created and sold while at Bear, end of quote. Chairwoman Shapiro, how can this be? How can the same executives responsible, allegedly responsible for these abuses now be making millions of dollars running different companies? Congressman, um, as you know, we have a um, very aggressive enforcement division at the SEC that has got um, under investigation um, many um, issues arising out of the financial crisis. And indeed, we have brought about two dozen cases or so coming out of the financial crisis. You mentioned um, the Goldman Sachs case, but there are many others that name both firms and individuals, officers, chief financial officers and others. And we will continue to um, investigate those very aggressively. Wherever the facts and the law will take us, we will go. And if there are appropriate actions to be brought against particular individuals, we won't hesitate to bring those cases. You know, the Atlantic article also said this, and I quote, and it said, last week a lawsuit filed in 2008 by mortgage insurer 
AMBAC Assurance Company against Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan was unsealed. And this is a quote. The lawsuit supporting emails going back as far as 2005 highlight bear traders telling their superiors they were selling investors like AMBAC a, quote, sack of shit, end of quote. Chairman Shapiro, are you aware of those emails? I am not specifically aware of those emails, although I would imagine that our enforcement um, division is. And I should add that it is not just the SEC that is stepping up here. It is the other financial regulators through the Mortgage Fraud Task Force and through efforts um, in conjunction with the Department of Justice and others to try to um, bring as many of these cases as we can. This is astonishing. And if, and if accurate, they indicate that some of the same executives knew exactly what they were doing and simply didn't care. As I understand it, Bear Stearns was acquired by J.P. Morgan three years ago. On May 7, 2011, The Atlantic reported that the SEC has now subpoenaed J.P. Morgan in connection with these allegations. Chairman Shapiro, or perhaps you, Ms. Cross, without going into any sensitive information, what can you tell us about these allegations, about your investigation, or about your concerns about these abuses? And can you tell us what subpoenas uh, the subpoenas seek from J.P. Morgan? Um, Congressman, as a, as a matter of, of policy and fairness, we generally don't comment on ongoing enforcement, specific ongoing enforcement matters. Um, I, I, will, I can see if there is more information we can provide for the record that wouldn't um, jeopardize any ongoing investigation, and if that is possible, we will provide that. As an officer of the Court, I understand. Thank you. I, think, uh, I still think that this whole, I, you know, the reason why I raise these issues is because we must never forget what we, we just went through, or still going through. We must never forget our constituents who have suffered and continue to suffer, many of them having lost everything. And I just thank you again for the balance that you uh, seek to, uh, in, in, the balance that you bring to the table in seeking to address these issues. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We now recognize the member of the Financial Services Committee and Subcommittee Chairman here, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Well, I thank, Henry. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Mr. Shapiro, thank you for your uh, service to our government, and we appreciate you being back. Um, I do have a question. There's a, the SEC has a 499 shareholder cap. Can you explain what that is? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, one of the ways in which a, a company becomes a reporting company under the SEC's reporting regime, there are five different ways, but one is that if the company has total assets of more than $10 million and 500 record shareholders, um, you become a reporting company and you have to file Exchange Act uh, registration statement and then ongoing disclosure. And who are those investors limited to? What types of investors? Accredited um, investors, institutional investors, and employees, right? It's it's all investors. Right. It's all uh, any all investors um, in the company. No, no, th those that sought to, for instance, to invest in Facebook, right? Right. Right. In order to be a, a, an accredited investor, you have to have a million dollars net worth, right? To yes. Be, right. Um, or you have to be an institutional investor, and an institutional investor is uh, what a hundred million dollars in your fund. Is that Correct? Okay. And or employees of the company, right? Those are the three classes of people uh, that that cap is, uh, they can participate under that cap, well, there correct? May be, there may be other investors as well. Uh, the 500 number includes anyone who is an investor. There aren't any who, under the current rules that are excluded from the count. So employees count, accredited investors count, qualified institutional right. buyers count. That is one of the questions we would be looking at, is whether we should count them. Right. So why 500? Five, um, 500 was originally put in the um, statute in the 1960s, I think. Um, and uh, uh, My understanding was that this is not statute, that this is uh, SEC wrote this, right? Is that not the case? Um, I will ask Meredith to correct me if I go wrong. My understanding is it is in the statute, although we do have the authority to write rules that would change that. When the, when the 
after the statute was passed, the Commission did write rules that went to how those 500 counted. Um, so, for example, there may actually be thousands of investors under that 500 threshold because we count holders of records. So if a broker-dealer is holding thousands and thousands of uh, stock for thousands of institu uh, institutional or other customers, that counts as one because the broker-dealer is the holder of records. So, so why? Why, why 500? Well, the, the view, I believe, at the time that No, what's the view now? The view because now, you have the authority to well, change it. It's an issue, obviously, that we're looking at very closely in our study. The view is that um, when a company has sufficient following, perhaps 500 is a bit of an arbitrary number, that th those investors ought to have access to information on an ongoing basis about the company, that it has sufficient following that um, there ought to be um, public disclosure. Okay. And really, you are talk talking about protecting people that have a million dollars in net worth or institutional investors or employees of the company. Uh, that is, you know, the threshold here. So it seems to me that the SEC policy is restricting access, because small businesses are the ones that we are really talking about here, trying to access private capital with, with these investors. And so it seems to me that really the SEC policy is that you are trying to protect the very people that this President says should play, pay more in taxes, higher taxes, uh, or these sophisticated investors at the expense of small businesses accessing credit. Uh, do you see it that way or, or, or not? Well, Congressman, we, we see it as absolutely um, a, a legitimate thing for us to be inquiring about is whether that 500 number does continue to make sense, whether, as some have proposed, qualified institutional investors are um, excluded from it, whether employees ought to be excluded from it, although I will say um, they are no less deserving of the protections of the securities laws than right, any, but, any but other what investor. I'm, my point is, if you are a sophisticated institution, uh, institutional investor, uh, I don't think the SEC is going to protect you from Bernie Madoff, which clearly the SEC didn't do. Um, and these folks are very sophisticated and know the decisions they are making. Uh, and for heaven's sakes, you know, um, if you look at, at, at these substantial institutional players, they have got better research and better information than the SEC or the government does. Well, this is exactly the issue we are looking at. Um, and, of course, they are not all sophisticated institutions, but I, I, I take well, your No, you are talking about a person point. with a, with a million-dollar net worth um, is, is a, as an accredited investor. Not only do you have to have a million-dollar net worth, but you, then you have to be accredited, saying that you are sharp enough to do this stuff. Um, you know, it, it seems to me I am sort of dismayed that the SEC didn't protect uh, the, the grandmothers that had their life savings taken from Bernie Madoff, but are trying to protect these people with a million dollars net worth um, in the name of really starving uh, small businesses from capital. Well, Congressman, I would say we are we're receiving a wide range of proposals in this area. We are absolutely committed to looking at whether this threshold makes any sense, whether the threshold um, numbers for firms to stop reporting once they have been reporting, even though they may have thousands of shareholders, is appropriate, too. And we intend to do a very thorough and rigorous analysis. Thank you. When do you think you will have a, a decision? Well, we, we've got multiple work streams, um, as, as you can see from my testimony. Um, this is the one work stream that's going to require economic data and analysis, because we need to understand the characteristics of these companies and how they hold, how their um, uh, shareholders um, uh, hold, whether in record name or in, in the name of the beneficial owner. Um, and the staff has already begun to develop the work plan um, for this particular work stream. And, I would love to come back to you with a more concrete time frame, but I, I can assure you that it is front and center uh, on our agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you for testifying. Thank you, the gentleman. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. I uh, thank the chairman for yielding and welcome uh, Chairwoman Shapiro. Um, we have heard uh, repeatedly that uh, the IPO market in the United States has declined uh, significantly in recent years. And I would like to examine uh, this claim. Experts from the SEC and the Federal Reserve analyzed a survey of 18,000 IPOs from 90 different countries between 1995 and 2007. And they issued a paper entitled Going Public Abroad. And the paper makes the conclusion, and it says, and I would like to quote from the re report, the U.S. domestic market has by a wide margin the largest proceeds of any of the markets worldwide. 
for example, the paper finds that the U.K. saw a decline in the average proceeds generated by domestic and global IPOs uh, during this period, but the United States did not. And uh, the paper says that uh, we did not in the U.S. see a significant change. And basically, the paper says that we need to look beyond the number of IPOs and examine uh, the question of the amount of revenue generated. And uh, it looked at uh, IPOs, uh, 57 deals in the U.S. that raised over $27 billion in the fourth quarter of 2010. And uh, further says that the United States achieved the highest IPO revenue total in the fourth quarter of 2010 since the fourth quarter of 1999. And uh, so my question to you is uh, basically on the fact that the article says when excluding the $17 billion Visa IPO in 2008, which was the largest, as you know, IPO in the history of our country, the first quarter, 2011, generated the highest first quarter proceeds since 2000. Uh, so, uh, Chairman Shapiro, these indicators suggest that the U.S. IPOs are in their strongest in years. And I would like a unanimous consent to put these uh, papers in the record. And I would like to ask you, Chairman uh, uh, Shapiro, whether or not you agree. Is this correct? Without objection, so ordered. I think there is no question but that um, the IPO market is rebounding, and we, we can see the numbers starting to change. And as you point out, the fourth quarter of 2010, uh, we saw 60 IPOs, and this year, uh, uh, last year overall, we saw something like 153 percent increase. We are not back to historic levels, um, and there are lots of reasons for that. But um, we do have fewer small IPOs. We still have um, uh, um, many very large IPOs that, that contribute, I think, to the number of, of um, many billions of dollars raised in the U.S. IPO market. But I don't think there is any question but that we are starting to see this market come back, and you need only pick up the newspaper virtually every day now to see um, at least anecdotally evidence of that. But again, our numbers would also bear out that this market is, is rebounding. And certainly, we lead the world in volume. In dollars um, raised. And yes, I would like right. to uh, ask about uh, the IPOs in the global marketplace. And according to Ernst & Young, 69 percent of the global volume of IPOs in 2010 originated in so-called emerging markets. And I would like to particularly look at activity in China. And uh, China made the largest IPO ever in the financial sector with a $22 uh, billion offering, but it was of a State-owned commercial bank, the Agricultural Bank of uh, China. And Ernst & Young re reported in the report that China's IPO in infrastructure and, uh, and clean tech was boosted dramatically uh, by government stimulus funding. You obviously have a huge IPO if the government is funding it. And it goes on to point out that it far outweighed U.S. stimulus uh, in the China spent over $586 billion in infrastructure and transportation projects and $735 billion in renewable energy. But as we know, in our $778 billion stimulus package, it only had $48 billion in transportation and $16 billion in, in, uh, $21 billion in re renewable energy. So my question uh, to you, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, is has the SEC analyzed the extent to which the IPO growth in China relates to extensive State spending? Congressman, we have not specifically looked at the issue of the extent to which um, governmental spending is influencing um, foreign IPO markets. I will say that generally um, we are seeing much more mature markets abroad than we have historically, making them more hospitable and more credible places for companies to do IPOs that might have um, years ago come to the United States market. Well, Thank the, uh, the uh, Renaissance Capital Research wrote in an article entitled I U.S. IPOs on top again. And this article finds there has been a lack of uh, U.S.-listed Chinese IPOs 
because U. S. investors have, have balked at the for, poor quality of IPOs in, in China. And my question to you, Madam Chair. The gentlelady's time has expired. Can I just throw one little question to her? Uh, if you can be very brief. Okay. Uh, does the SEC uh, find that foreign markets may not impose the same high standards imposed on U.S. firms issuing IPOs domestically? Well, uh, one of the interesting phenomenons, and I know Congressman McHenry is very interested in this as well, is the phenomenon of companies that are not um, necessarily incorporated in China but have their uh, large part of their operations in China actually um, doing reverse mergers as opposed to IPOs and coming into the U.S. market to list on U.S. exchanges. And, and there are a number of issues there about which we are quite concerned um, and uh, working through with the um, Chinese regulators. Thank you. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, is the, is the uh, general solicitation ban constitutional, and can you cite me to specific published opinions that support your position? Congressman, I think um, that you raise a very um, good question with respect to the general solicitation ban, and the Chairman has raised that uh, as well in uh, some of his correspondence. And we, we absolutely recognize that the general solicitation ban does limit speech to some extent. And so it is one of the issues um, that we are doing, uh, we are looking at in our study, and, um, and, and a First Amendment analysis um, will be part of that. I think the issue for us is whether the general solicitation ban um, passes First Amendment muster, but in addition, um, whether its protection of investors is appropriately balanced with the need for companies to be able to effectively uh, communicate in order to raise capital. And so that is one of the issues we will be looking at closely. Well, given the fact that it implicates a fundamental right, you have the, the, the strictest uh, level of constitutional scrutiny, and it has to be as narrowly drawn as it possibly can be, if you conclude in your own independent analysis that it is not constitutional, will you do what there is some precedent in the executive branch for doing, which is not enforcing laws that you don't think um, are constitutional? Um, will you abandon the ban if you conclude that it doesn't pass constitutional muster? I believe, um, I obviously can't predict where we will come out on this issue, but we would, um, rather than not enforce the law that is on the books, we would seek to, to, to change it. There is some precedent for not enforcing the laws that are on the books. I think you would agree with me. There, there is precedent, but um, I, I have um, uh, have a sworn to duty to uphold that. the law and the Constitution, and so I would be a bit uncomfortable with just ignoring a provision of the law. But that said, this is an area that we will, we will be looking at very carefully. With respect to um, 2008, um, do you know or can you tell me the number of defendants who received active prison sentences, not fines, not promises not to do it again, but active prison sentences? Um, I really can't speak. We don't have criminal authority and we don't prosecute um, cases in the, crim in the uh, criminal justice system. I can tell you that for the Securities and Exchange Commission in 2008, we brought more than 670 cases uh, with disgorgement of ill-gotten gains and penalties that were ordered of over a billion dollars and a billion dollars returned to investors who had been harmed by securities fraud. And those are, are very big, laudable numbers. Of those cases, how many did you refer for criminal prosecution to a respective United States Attorney's Office? Um, I would guess a, a healthy number, um, but I, and I would be happy to provide that exact number to you. Um, I would be interested, because I am asked quite often in South Carolina why nobody goes to jail. Uh, if you are rich and all you do is steal money, you don't go to jail. Um, so I, I, I am very interested, and I am also interested in whether or not the SEC would have appeared and ask for an enhanced sentence or an upward departure, um, given the, uh, uh, the erosion of public trust uh, that was manifest in 2008. Congressman, I think if you look at the sanctions that the SEC has leveled over the past several years for um, violations, again, civil violations of the Federal Securities Laws, you will see that they have ramped up rather significantly. I gave you the numbers for 2008, but in 2010, our disgorgement of ill-gotten gains and penalties reached $2.85 billion, 
and we returned $2 billion uh, to uh, harmed investors, $2.2 billion. I, I am not giving short shrift to your disgorgement. Uh, that is wonderful. Um, but you can criminally prosecute and disgorge someone of their ill-gotten gains at the same time. And uh, uh, nothing gets people's attention quite like an active prison sentence. There is no question about that. And we make many referrals to the Justice Department. And we bring many cases jointly with uh, local U.S. attorneys and district attorneys around the country um, and try to interest them in bringing uh, more securities fraud cases whenever we can. Uh, Ma'am, would you be gracious enough to, to get me um, Obviously, I don't want pending investigations, but cases that are that are concluded that were referred to various U.S. Attorney's offices Absolutely. and what the outcome was. I'd be happy to. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, yield. Did the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, just one quick question. I know you can't always answer hypotheticals, but as you're aware, uh, we we allow and have for a decade or more allowed prescription drugs of all classes, but we'll just take, for example sleeping aids that are prescription only to be advertised with a basically a must see a doctor to get the appropriate advice. In a sense, as uh, Mr. Gowdy said, if, if there is an inherent bias toward free speech, isn't it most likely that you are going to end up looking at that model and saying, well, wait a second, if we limit the purchase of these companies to qualified investors, other you know institutions and so on. If we're limiting who can buy, if the, any advertising were to explain that you cannot buy it unless you fit in this category, why, what would be the harm any more in a general solicitation than there is in pe making people aware about a prescription drug, knowing that they must go to a doctor before they can have it prescribed? Mr. Chairman, I, th I think you, you raise exactly the right issue. I, I will say there is a concern um, that um, the general solicitation ban is designed to make it more difficult for those who would defraud others by casting a very wide net, even in the private placement market, um, and, and have a, an easier way to defraud people um, because of the general solicitation, the general advertisement, the, the way to bring pe more people into a fraudulent scheme. Um, that said, as you know, we are going to look at this very carefully. Thank you, Madam Chair. We now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you and uh, the ranking member for holding this hearing. And let me thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Shapiro, for the outstanding job that you are doing. Uh, in your written statement, you indicated that 22 percent of the SEC cases in FY10 were offering frauds. Chairman Shapiro, can you give us an example of an offering fraud? I would be happy to. And I will say that um, you know, every Thursday the Commission meets in a closed session to consider a dozen or more enforcement cases. And um, so it is very much on my mind as we go through this process to ensure that we don't lose sight of, even though I think there is some flexibility, there are things we need to look at, there may be things we can do quite differently, we not lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day there are investors who need the protections provided by the Federal Securities Laws. But what we see are um, offerings by promoters or others um, of stock in a company where the disclosure has been false or misleading, uh, the information is, has been manufactured, um, where there are um, uh, unre unregistered offerings and they are sold to people who are not accredited investors or appropriately qualified to buy that um, particular offering. And An another type we see significant numbers of are affinity frauds, where they, where they target um, particular categories of people, like the elderly. Um, so you see a, a, a broad range. It is not the kinds of companies that, that we all think of as appropriately using our exemptions, but they drive through those, those exemptions and go after people who are not able to fend for themselves. One of the things that worries me a great deal as we look at the question of loosening the ban, which I think is a very important thing to consider, is how we then make sure that the people who buy really are the accredited investors who don't need the protections, because they do target those people. The fraudsters do target those people. If they go and caught, what is the effect of these frauds on investors and the market if they go and caught? The, um, the frauds can be devastating to investors, and, and that is true really of any kind of securities fraud. But people um, have been convinced in, in many of these schemes to um, invest their life savings and are left with nothing uh, at the end of the process.
Let me, um, Chairman Shapiro, what are some of the examples of things that the SEC has done to facilitate communication connected with public offerings? Um, uh, Congressman, over the years, the SEC has um, engaged in a number of, of efforts to um, make it uh, increasingly possible for um, companies to communicate during the quiet period, which is when they generally are not communicating. Um, for example, um, we created a research report safe harbor to encourage um, the publication of research reports during the quiet period. Um, we allow free writing prospectuses, which permit offers outside the statutory prospectus. Um, we allow the media um, to publish stories about companies or their registered offerings, um, so long as the media is unpaid and not affiliated uh, with the issuer. Um, we have um, done a number of offering-related uh, communication safe harbors, again, that allow issuers to communicate more details about transactions uh, to potential investors uh, during the quiet period. So we have taken a number of steps, um, primarily starting in 2005, to try to relax some of the restrictions on uh, issuers during the quiet period. Right. Thank you. Uh, do, you give, do you view the general solicitation ban as an impediment to capital raising for small businesses? We, if we, not, go ahead. Well, I am sorry. We have heard um, from some, some small businesses that, that the general solicitation ban um, makes it harder for them to reach investors uh, and to raise capital. That is one of the things that we will be looking at as we do our study of the general solicitation ban. Uh, we want to understand the extent to which it is an impediment or an unnecessary hurdle um, to capital formation. Thank you very much. I would be delighted to yield to the ranking member. Yeah, just, just following up on what you just said, when you, when you go into trying to figure that out, um, whether it is harming and folks, I mean, what, what kind of factors will, would you likely be looking at? I am not trying to get into your head for you to tell us everything you are going to do, but I mean, what kind of things will you be looking at to, to come up with a reasonable uh, answer to that? Well, I think with respect to that one in particular, we will probably do um, interviews with businesses um, that are, that are uh, pre-IPO businesses or, um, uh, or their advisors. We will also ask investors and the, and the general public. We might put out a concept release and seek information uh, and detail that way. And hopefully we will use our new advisory committee on, on small business uh, activities. They, they, um, we have multiple areas we want to explore here, and there will be different approaches for each one. For example, with respect to the 500 shareholder uh, threshold, there we want um, data and analysis of what uh, the characteristics of these companies, which will be hard to get because they are private companies, um, and, um, and uh, understand how their um, stock, uh, how their um, holders hold their um, securities, whether they hold them in street name or in. Uh, indirect name and so forth. So we, for each of the work streams that we are going to be exploring, um, we have started to lay out the data and the information we think will be most useful for us in trying to strike that appropriate balance. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar. Thank you, Chairman. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, how many regulations are there out there that a small company that wants to go public uh, that they have to apply to? How, how many apply? Do you have um, I can try with that. The, for a company that is going to conduct an IPO, there is a, a, a registration form, Form S-1, that is the main place they have to look. Then there is a series of regulations that govern what you are allowed to, to do in the way of communications during the offering. So there is probably, you know, I would say in the SEC's books, probably 50, 50 rules, something around like that. I mean, we could certainly supplement for the record. Okay. It's, it's a pretty um, tried and true path. So. For the companies that go through an IPO, it, it, the advisors to them, I used to do this before I came to work at the SEC, there is a pretty clear path. There are handbooks that people hand out to their companies as they are thinking about going public. So it is not quite as daunting as you might think. So you would say it is adequate if there is not too many, not too few? I, I can't tell you that there is. I think that the, the balance is, is, is manageable. I think there are definitely a lot of rules, um, but the, the the goal here is to make sure that as companies are accessing the public markets for money, that they, 
that um, investors are protected enough so that they feel confident going and in investing. And, and do they, re, and do they um, are they nimble with the times? I think that we can certainly think about that. As they were, we revised the offering rules very significantly in 2005. It was called Securities Offering Reform, and it was a huge overhaul. It is what, for the first time, let companies have free writing prospectuses, let them keep talking during quiet periods, let them have electronic road shows online. So it was a pretty big change, and I think it has really helped. Um, that doesn't mean we can't do more to help. So we're, we always are looking at our rules to see whether we are doing what we can to facilitate capital formation consistent with investor protection. So, so when you are looking at fraud, going back to Mr. Gowdy here, um, you know, uh, being a dentist and being a private sector aspect and, and looking at the regulations at the State, um, when there is an IPO that is a foreign base versus a, a, a U.S. predominantly based, do you see a problem or predilection within those groups of where you have to have more enforcement? I'm sorry, sir. Taking it's a, an IPO that is foreign based versus a, predominantly versus a U.S. or an IPO that is U.S. based predominantly, do you see much more enforcement issues from one of those segments? I, I guess I would say that I think um, it depends on what markets you're looking at. There are there's quite a range of of uh, requirements around the world with respect to um, the process of of. It, accessing the public markets. I mean, there is no question but that the SEC in the United States has uh, one of the best developed enforcement programs and um, polices the markets. We think, you know, there is always more to do, but pretty effectively. Um, but I think other markets now um, are stepping up and doing very much the same thing, because what they understand is that to be a credible location for an IPO um, and to, for people to feel comfortable investing in new companies, there has to be a credible enforcement regime around that so that fraud is, is stopped and uh, people can have confidence in the integrity of the financial statements and the disclosures that the companies are making. So I actually think there is kind of a rising tide around the world in this regard. Well, I am worried about, more about right here in the United States. Do you see a problem more with IPOs that are with foreign-based, that are predominantly foreign-based or U.S.-based? I think um, I'm sorry I misunderstood your question, but but clearly we've had um, some issues recently, and you've I'm sure read about them in the paper with respect to uh, reverse mergers of uh, companies whose primary operations are in China, although they may not be registered and generally they aren't registered in China and they aren't subject to the jurisdiction of the Chinese SEC, uh, and our ability um, to deal with um, the disclosure uh, shortcomings of some of those companies. So we've had a very active program at the SEC including um, suspending, um, revoking the registrations of eight Chinese companies in the last month or so and suspending the trading in just the last couple of weeks of three more of those. I, I had the opportunity yesterday to meet with the chairman of the Ch China Securities Regulatory Commission and talk about how we can establish a framework for our enforcement and examination staff to have better access to information about these companies who are not incorporated in China but whose primary operations are in China and whose auditors are in China so we can understand the quality uh, and the truthfulness of their disclosures. One real quick question. Is there one part of the marketplace for these particular investments? I am looking at medical devices that are having some problems in which there are public offerings. Do you see any recourse or any aspects so that you are looking at one segment of the population of investors? Um, it has been interesting to me over the years to see that um, we often have fraud in whatever industry is hottest at the moment. So a number of our actions with respect to these um, companies with operations in China have been in the energy space. Um, but they can be in whatever they think uh, investors will be most um, taken with at that particular moment. Well, thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, and if the chairwoman can allow a couple of minutes for the gentlelady from the District of Columbia who has been waiting here patiently. Re you are recognized for up to five minutes based on her time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your, for your indulgence and, uh, and welcome, uh, Chair Chairwoman Shapiro. Uh, you, you have a very tough. You had a very. You always have a tough job, particularly after the uh, extraordinary uh, crash after 2008. You got. You had to somehow encourage continued investment without getting us back into the terrible hole uh, we were trying to get out of. Now, you can have an ideological notion of cause and effect uh, that says the government caused, uh, government regulation, for example, caused this, or it's opposite that the failure of regulation caused this. 
but whatever uh, is your notion, and I hope we're not, we're not into that kind of uh, catechism of cause and effect, I'd like to, uh, to have you discuss uh, the effect uh, on investors. Uh, I have some figures here that showed uh, some, some remarkable um, actions, which I think was very rational behavior. But investors pulled more than $272 billion out of the stock market. And it looks as if when they went to invest, they invested in the bond market, which they regarded as more as safer. $272 billion out, $650 billion into bond funds. Uh, and then if you look at the middle class, um, 70 percent of uh, the, the money in the 401ks um, uh, were taken out, the proportion fell to, or, or lost, the proportion then fell to 49 uh, percent, and it's back up to 57 percent. So. I would like you to discuss um, the effect that, that this collapse had on investor confidence uh, and how it affected the availability of capital. In other words, if, if people were not putting their money in the stock market, what, the, what was the effect on the availability of capital? Congressman, I think, um, and I, I believe this very deeply, that the, um, the foundation of our markets is absolutely built on investor confidence, and we can see how portable capital is and how quickly investors will react to what they perceive to be failures in the marketplace because of fraud, because of inadequate information. And an issue I am most particularly familiar with is what happened after May 6th, when our equity markets performed in a very aberrational way as a result of market structure flaws and high frequency trading. And we saw for months and months after that a, a steady outflow of investor funds from equity mutual funds um, because of concern about uh, the integrity of the trading mechanism in the marketplace. So I think um, for us, um, instilling and restoring investor confidence in the integrity of our markets, whether it is the disclosure regime or the market structure itself, is really paramount to the ability of companies to do IPOs and raise capital and create jobs and grow our economy, which is at the end of the day what, what all of us want to see happen. And um, for us, that means getting this balance right between protecting investors and making access to capital affordable and efficient uh, is really sort of job one right now for us to, to strike that balance appropriately. So the, the um, collapse uh, then decreased uh, uh, the, the ability of firms um, to access the capital markets and to raise money on the uh, stock exchanges. Uh, now, there are some who suggest that if you roll back the investor protections, um, that the, the impact uh, would be um, some, of the, some of what we see in this chart uh, would be alleviated. What do you think would be the impact on the confidence of American uh, investors if you were to roll back or we were to roll back the investor protections that have recently been instituted or established? Well, while I think it is very worthwhile for us to look at whether our rules can be um, altered and tweaked in a way um, that facilitates capital formation and doesn't harm investor protection, I think a, a complete rollback of investor protections wouldn't serve anybody's interests, not investors nor companies. Well, how much of a role? I mean, do you think any rollback? The lady's time has expired. If you could finish answering the question, I also know you have a hard stop time Thank of you. five minutes ago. So. Um, um, I, I think it, it, it's it is not a uh, question that can be answered in generalities. I think it is really a matter of looking at each and every one of our rules to see where there might be flexibility that will facilitate capital formation without doing harm to the investor protections, because at the end of the day, those protections serve the companies well as well as investors. Gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, Chairman Shapiro, thank you thank for you. appearing before the committee and thank you for your time. And, uh, 
uh, we certainly hope that you can make it to your next appointment in time. And with that, uh, five minutes for Mr. Lankford from Oklahoma. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Chairman Shapiro, for being able to be here. So I appreciate your time. No, no, I completely understand. Uh, we are going to talk through a little bit of the uh, XBRL language shift uh, that has happened a little bit. And one good chance to talk a little bit about that. 2009 SEC started collecting the financial statements using that XBRL language and the plain text. <clears throat> Can you update us on the efforts and, and on that transition? How is that going at this point? Uh, where are we uh, in that shift? Um, I appreciate your question. The XBRL requirements are being rolled out over time um, based on the original adoption schedule. So the next the next phase of companies is the smallest companies have to start tagging in XBRL the, the face of their financials, and I think they have to block tag footnotes. And the rest of the, the, the larger companies will be doing the detail tagging of their footnotes, I believe, starting after, for quarters ending after June 15th. So it is, it is in the works. And, right. uh, how, how is that going as far as the rollout? What has been the response back from companies on that? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's I will I'll admit, it is mixed. Some companies are um, very concerned about the additional time that it takes, and so we hear that they would like there to be, for example, a time delay between when they have to get the XBRL on file compared to when the 10Q, for example, the quarterly report is due, which is a question we have been thinking about. Uh, we have also been um, you know, hearing that there are concerns in the smaller business community about the possible costs of, of taking on this new requirement um, in, in June. But at the same time, I would say that the, the usefulness of the information is starting to become more apparent. So recently our staff was able to do some really good analysis based on the, using the tagged information. And I was really pleased with what you could do comparing, um, for example, pension fund rates of return being assumed in the financial statement. So that it's, it's, it's a new cost and it's a new burden, but it's also um, useful information. Okay. How is that going as far as the fraud and, and capturing that? What we are just talking about as well from the SEC side, uh, is, it, is it fulfilling what we had hoped it would fulfill? I think we're, it's too early to tell. Okay. Um, you know, the, these, the amounts are now, just now starting to show up in the financial statements, and we are just now getting the tools to use it, because the okay. key here is that you have to be able to use it. And, and we have you know, had to spend the money to be able to buy the tools to use the data, so we are not, we're not at that point yet. But it is, it is helping us issue better comments on the filings of companies when we see aberrational amounts. Um, that, that show up because right. of the. Are we picking it up faster? I know this, this is, it, it has to be faster than pen and paper reading through it on plain text and going through it with a pencil. You, you need both, I, okay. I will tell so you. So, perpetually, need... we are going to have both the plain text version and the XBRL version, you think, as far as submitting it? I think it is going to depend a lot on how the markets and the, and the investing public develops, because unless the public can use XBRL, we need the plain text. Okay. Because it is the information at the end of the day is for them, not for us. Let me ask you uh, on a couple of things. Where are we as far as timeline on the fiduciary rules? Um, and that has been a topic of obvious conversation and uh, trying to figure out when are these fiduciary rules going to come down, dealing with the brokers and CFPs and all that. How is that going to balance that? Not necessarily what the decision is, it's not what I'm asking. When is the timeline for the decision? I apologize. I will have to get back to you with an answer for the record. That is not, that's not in my corporation finance division. So with, with Chairman Shapiro um, not here, I, I, I don't know the answer. I believe that it is it, it's not right now. Um, right. But I, that but part I, I knew. Yeah. I, I, so you know more than me. I am sorry. I will have to get back to you with an answer for the record. Okay. We will we'll try to follow up on that on the record just to get a feeling on that. Uh, going back to some of the other information, the prospectus and such, as, as it comes out, uh, give, give me a feel. I, there is somewhat a sense that we can solve a problem with dealing with fraud based on adding more text to someone at the beginning. Uh, if you go to a typical construction site right now, there are 28 different posters up on the wall in a construction site defining out all the issues that are there. Uh, if you are going to get a home mortgage, uh, be prepared for reams and reams of paperwork that are going to be involved in that. The prospectus is rather long for a lot of things. Are, is that fulfilling what we hope it would fulfill by continuing to add additional text to different perspectives to get more information out to it? Or has it hit a point where no one is going to read it because it is so protracted now? 
I think that is an excellent question. Um, and in fact, one of the projects that I have wanted to undertake is a, is a review of all the disclosure requirements to see if there is some we could actually get rid of. That would be very helpful. Because there is a pile-on um, effect. Right. Um, so I agree that there can be too much. Investors and analysts in particular tend to want more, more information. And so to take some away can take some doing. Right. Um, but we, I, I think it is very important that we take a look, and I agree with you that we need to be careful to not just pile on. That would be very helpful. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Mr. Tierney is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cross, for being here today. I, I don't have a, a lot of questioning for you. We just wanted to touch on Sir Baines Oxley a little bit uh, in that Section 404 that requires uh, that an auditor attest to the entity's internal financial controls. I know there has been some discussion. The first $75 million is exempted out. Companies over $75 million are in. Some people want to raise it to $250 million. Um, I would like to have your opinion on, on the effectiveness, of the, first of all, the burden uh, on the $75 million as opposed to two fifty, and whether or not it is outweighed by the benefits on that and just what the benefits are. I appreciate the question. For the, um, as you know, in Dodd-Frank, in the Dodd-Frank Act, the, the companies below 75 million public float were exempted from the audit requirement under 404B. That actually takes out of the mix 60 percent of the public companies, which is quite a, quite a significant number. Uh, the, the staff just posted its study, as required by the Act, of the companies between 75 and 250 and found several important um, characteristics of those companies, one of which is that the companies in that category tend to change a lot. So you, it, companies in the 75 to 250 may not be the same year after year. So changing the application of 404 to that group is very complicated and doesn't really help them very much because they would be moving in and out. We also found that the companies in that category don't tend to be particularly different from the companies above 250. Um, so it's not a it's not a discrete category that has characteristics that lend itself to saying well this is the group that should be out and the benefit of the audit um, you know it certainly it is a, it, it costs money the costs have come way down over the years with the addition of, of the AS5 the the auditing standard that brought down the, the cost of that audit but I think that um, the, the staff's conclusion was that the benefits of having that second set of eyes at that at this point. Um, outweigh the, the, um, the, benef the cost of the audit. Uh, ironically, I think one of the findings for the chief accountant uh, was that uh, when they attest to the accuracy of financial statements, they are more accurate. I mean, that is pretty common sense, but they, they are finding out that that is the case. That that's right. They, when there is going to be a second set of eyes, I guess people are a bit more careful. What do you think the consequence of eliminating the safeguards of sub Ains actually in that respect would be? I am sorry, eliminating the? The 404B provision. I mean, I think that there would be a significant concern that the that the um, the care taken in establishing and testing the internal controls would would go down over time. Um, not having that second set of eyes, I think, is 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 important. The other thing is that is that if you don't have the internal controls audit, then the auditors have to do testing of the internal controls to see how much they can rely on the financial statements even without the audit of the internal controls. So the costs don't necessarily correlate one for one. Well, thank you for being with us this morning, Ms. Cross. I uh, yield back. And with that, uh, Mr. Meehan is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Cross, for being here uh, here today. I want to step off on an issue that was raised by my my partner to the left, China, and the discussion of the of, of fraud that enters our marketplace. As we get in, into increasing globalization, and more people come to raise capital in the United States, but have significant assets and operations overseas, what kind of protections do we have in place to assure that if there is a remedy that needs to be reached, that we can get at assets or individuals or otherwise that are operating in these foreign countries? Uh, that is a very good question, um, Congressman. We don't, we don't have the same remedies that we do here. Um, and the, the, the way the securities laws are structured, we deal with that through disclosure. We let, we let companies warn um, investors that they won't have the same remedies if there is a problem with the company. Um, we don't, the SEC doesn't have a merit regulation screen. We don't have authority to tell companies you can't raise money here. 
if you provide sufficient disclosure. What we have tried to do, though, to provide as much investor protection as we can in light of these concerns is, for example, um, Chairman Shapiro met yesterday with the head of the Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission to discuss better ways for us to share information, to get at um, the, our concerns about are these companies for real, um, who are their promoters. And we, we have a new initiative to, to get a better sense of how are the audits being done. Um, you, know, you, you do have to have an audit, and so are we, are we appropriately regulating those auditors? Are they going over and looking at these companies, or are they doing it remotely with people on contract? That would be a concern. These are all issues that we, we recognize are very important that we get at, um, and, and so we are doing the best we can. Well, that is right. I mean, it's not just, uh, it's, it's not just those auditors. It is also the ability for sort of the independent analysts that come. There is already a shortage of the kind of analysis that we would like to be seen on the market now. I think there has been a shrinking of the, the, the banking institutions and otherwise commitment to do an analysis. Are we getting the kind of cooperation to allow analysts to travel to the foreign countries and be given complete access to the information that, that companies here would be given to uh, analysts? Uh, that is a fair question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think we would be happy to check and get back to you for the record. Okay. Let me switch my, my questioning just on uh, the issue of the, the cap of the 500. One of the concerns that I have is, is in this environment we are seeing a great deal of, of frustration on the part of entrepreneurs who are trying to raise capital. Uh, in difficult times. Obviously, one of the things they, they are looking for is access to the markets. One of the things that inspires people to continue to work in, in sort of startup companies is the idea that they can take and, and, and gain some equity stake by being given shares in, in the company. Are we doing anything, or can you talk a little bit about what kind of incentives we can give to carve out the the, the counting of that 500 for individuals who are sweat equity holders in, in, in these startup companies? That is an excellent point, and I, and I um, appreciate that that is, that is a key way that they can, they can incentivize employees to come work for them and work hard. We have done a few things. First off, uh, the options that are granted to employees don't count against the 500. So we adopted a rule in 2007 that says you don't have to count the options. Um, we have the staff in my division has provided relief also to companies that they don't have to count restricted stock units that are provided to employees. So far, you still have to count stock. So if they hold, if they're stockholders like anyone else, our review that we're getting ready to undertake of Section 12G's 500 limit will consider the question of should employees be counted the same way. There are concerns. There are certainly frauds that happen where employees are the ones who they lose both their job and their investment. So you do want to watch out. You don't want employees to lose everything when there is a fraud at the company they work for. So we need to balance those. Yeah, my concern as well is the inability or the ability that it has to crowd out the, uh, the ability for, uh, it sort of limits the, the pool of people as well, the 500 that allows us to, to raise money if, in fact, you are including those kinds of shareholders in your number, it, then it makes a smaller pool that effectively you can raise your dollars from, which presumably then sort of has, would you agree that that has a chilling effect then on the ability? Because I would think that it would, it would cause the cost of that capital to increase for a small business trying to attract investors. We have heard that the 500 cap is, is an impediment to capital raising. And I, you know, the question we need to look at is, is 500 the right number, and are we counting correctly? Because there's a lot of companies that are actually private companies that trade in the OTC market that have thousands of holders, um, but they're held in street name, and so they only count by broker. And, we don't, and so we need to look at how are we counting, and is the number the right number, and are the right people included in the count? So there is a whole lot of, of good, hard questions we need to, to know the answers to. Thank you, Ms. Cross. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Ms. Cross. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cross, uh, between 1990 and, and, and 2000, were, or, or between the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, did SEC issue new regulations affecting IPOs? Um, not, no, I don't believe so. You did not issue new regulations? 
Um, affecting IPOs. That is what you just said. In, in that time frame, I am not aware that we had significant right. new regulations. And yet we are supposed to buy into an argument that it was this stifling new regulation or regulatory environment that, in fact, uh, choked off a IPO activity. So if one were to conclude that, well, you can't cite new regulations in that time period, um, one wonders what it might be. Um, are you familiar with uh, David Weald? Um, is that at the study? Former vice chairman of NASDAQ. Oh, yes, yes. He wrote a paper called Marker Structure is Causing the IPO Crisis in June of last year, co-authored with Edward Kim. And he writes, the crisis started before Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002. The IPO crisis was not induced by Sarbanes-Oxley, regulation, fair disclosure, or NSD Rule 2711, separation of banking and research. Each of these changes occurred well after the IPO crisis was underway. That is what he writes. Would you agree with that assessment? I think there is a, a, a whole host of reasons why IPOs are fewer than they, than they were before. And I think that um, I, I appreciate that different people um, attribute it to different reasons. I think that certainly the market structure has, has changed. There used to be a lot of smaller investment banks who did the small IPOs, and those small investment banks are mostly gone. Um, there used to be research written um, about little tiny companies, um, but the, the structure of the investment banking industry no longer supports research about little tiny companies. And so the little tiny companies are the ones that are not tapping the public markets. And I am sure cost of regulation is one factor in that. Um, but I also think that the market structure changes are also quite important. Well, he seems the former vice chairman of NASDAQ hardly a gun-ho regulator. He seems to believe that this IPO crisis predates whatever new regulation occurred post Sarbanes-Oxley, Sarbanes-Oxley and subsequently, and that, as a matter of fact, it's, it can be attributed to a dysfunctional IPO market itself, that there were, it's a failure of the market itself in terms of what happened with arbitrage, what happened in terms of where capital went, uh, sort of switching from uh, productivity uh, in, uh, oriented uh, investment opportunities to sort of quick turnaround investment opportunities, and you see that reflected in the broad market. Would you think that's a fair observation on his part? Well, I'm not. I'm not the expert that he is, but I would say that those are those are certainly observations that I've heard that that many agree with. Mm -hmm. um, would there be consequences, in your view, if we sort of had a broad brush? elimination of regulations currently governing the IPO market? Yes, I think there would be um, very significant negative consequences if that were to occur, because then you wouldn't have um, a, sort of a, a level set of minimum investor protections that could be expected as a company enters the public market seeking money. Um, so I think that there would be significant adverse consequences, both to the public and to the companies, because those that are good and honest would be harmed by the bad actors who would cause investor confidence to wane. And investor confidence is key to having um, a robust capital market. And have there been some bad actors? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Against whom the public needs to be protected. That, that's right, yes. So it is more than caveat emptor. Maybe the Federal Government has a role here to try to protect the consuming public and the investing public. Absolutely, yes. We have to calibrate the, the, the regulatory um, environment and the, um, the ability to raise capital and get it, get it right, and that is a, that's a very challenging task that we try very hard to do. Thank you. My time is up. Ms. Perkle for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have no questions. Thank you. Will the gentlelady yield? Absolutely. Thank you. I certainly appreciate uh, her yielding. And uh, uh, Ms. Cross, um, in terms of uh, uh, independent financial statements, having an, uh, uh, you know, ensuring that there is an independent audit 
of firms. Do you think that is proper and good procedure? Um, definitely, yes. That is okay. uh, it's a, I know it is an easy uh, question, but uh, and that gives the investors some assurance of the legitimacy of the financial statements. Yes, okay. it does. So in terms of, of uh, that step of the process, then the question about accredited investors. Why is there this class of accredited investors? Why is that important in the SEC's view? Well, the, the notion of accredited investors, just to be clear, there is no special accreditation. If you have a million dollars net worth, then you fit in the definition. If you make $200,000 a year, you fit in the definition. But why is that important? Um, those are the investors that, in, believe it or not, this test was put in in the early 80s. And in the early 80s, it was determined that those are investors who could fend for themselves and didn't need the protection of the securities laws, in, and so they could participate in unregistered private offerings. Okay. So why limit that number if, those, if that class of people doesn't need the level of protection that you are seeking for, for me as an average investor? You mean in connection with the 500 holder yes. limit? I think it's a fair question. I mean, I think that the I have I I will say that since the number was set in the early 80s, one might question whether that's still the right number to identify the people who can fend for themselves. But assume that it is, then when Congress put in the, its its test in the early 60s for the 500, did they have in mind that those were companies that were trading, and did they, for example, you you don't you have to register if you trade on the New York Stock Exchange. It doesn't matter if your investors are accredited or not. So it is a different test. It's, it's, if securities are trading in our markets, do we want a certain level of information available? But it is a fair question for a company that is not trading in a market today, should we eliminate some number of investors from that count, whether they be accredited or qualified institutional investors or, or some other group? And it is absolutely something we want to consider. Okay. Um, and that is part of the process that you are reviewing right now? Okay. Absolutely. Um, you know, because I think everyone has this question, what is the proper balance? Uh, now, in terms of general solicitation, I, I know there has been an enormous discussion because of what we saw with Facebook, that in essence, out of concern, um, uh, that it was a public solicitation because word got out of this private offering of Facebook stock, um, that that meant that they could not offer those securities to American investors. So they offered it to foreign investors. Um, now, I understand that there are regs on the books, but there is also litigation associated with that. Is there not a significant amount of litigation on what qualifies as uh, general solicitation? I think there is some case law about it. I mean, just to be clear, as, as we said in the letter that um, yes. Chairman Shapiro sent to Chairman Issa, the staff did not tell um, Goldman Sachs and Facebook that they couldn't conduct their offering in the United States. And in fact, there is some SEC guidance that would have actually suggested they could. They're, they may have decided not to conduct the offering here because of concerns about, about private parties um, asserting that they had a rescission right because of a potential public offering. So I, I, if that is what your question is. Is, is there going to be a, is there a review uh, currently about uh, general solicitation and, and those rules? Yes. That is that's definitely that's one of our work streams, is to consider whether the ban on general solicitation is still appropriate in this day and age. Okay. And, and um, what, what do you think your time frame is there? On that particular work stream, that is, is less complex um, than the 12G 500 holder work stream. So we have started already to put together the, the research that needs to be done. Um, I think my, my likely recommendation will be for the Commission to, to issue some sort of a what is called a concept release, where we put out the general question of, it, you know, does the public think this is a good idea? What, what dangers would it cause? So that is a I, I can't commit to a specific time frame, but it is certainly shorter than the, than the 12 next, uh, next year? Within the next year? I think certainly the process will start in this year. Okay. Um, and then right. we'll get we'll get the feedback. Thank you, and thank you for your candor. Uh, with that, Mr. Cooper is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions, but I'd be delighted to yield my time to my friend and colleague, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, let me um, just go back to something I had 
ask Chairwoman Shapiro about, and I was, I had asked her about um, when you gather all the information, um, what are the kinds of things that you will be looking at to strike the balance? She told me where the information would be coming from, but didn't get into what kind of things you are trying to, you know, to, I mean, what, what goes into that process of striking a balance. We have had a wonderful discussion here about the problems and, and what have you, but I am trying to figure out um, when, you, when you sit down to, at the table, um, are there certain principles that may be guiding, guiding principles so that you can even have a way of weighing what you are doing so that you come out with, and I am not asking you for your final solution, I am just trying to figure out what, is it, what are the kinds of things that you, that, you think, that you think that you all would be looking at, I mean, and concerned about, and that, like, again, those guiding kind of principles. That is an excellent question, um, Congressman. I, I think that the, uh, starting, for example, with the ban on general solicitation, if we eliminate the ban so that offerings, private offerings could be made to accredited investors through publicity, um, through advertising um, and the like, I would, I would want to know whether we are confident that the group that is getting sold to um, is the group that doesn't need protection and that the people that are getting sold to are, in fact, accredited investors. Um, so those are, those are things that I think will be important in the mix. If they don't need the protections of the securities laws, then it may make sense to make it easier to reach them. If they are the group that needs the protections of the securities laws, because either they are not really accredited and they are and they're getting, um, they have fraudulent brokers who are putting them into deals they shouldn't be in. So I am very concerned about that factor. So I would like to, those, and so in that area, those are the those will be going into our, the, the staff's recommendation. On the 500 holder limit, I would like to know um, what the investor makeup is in these companies, and I would like to know what the, what the characteristics are of these companies. Are these companies that are real companies? Um, are they more fraudulent companies that, that are trading in, in, the, you know, in the sort of dark markets? And it held in street name, and you don't really they have thousands of investors, but they only count as 200 because they're held through brokers. Or are these companies that are the engines of growth, and they have 499 holders, and they can't raise another dime because they can't get one more holder? Um, and they have those are 499 actual investors. I think those are important points. And if they if the answers come out. Um, you know, we may need different answers for different kinds of, of companies, different situated companies. Companies who go dark because they, they are, are, are held through street name might need a different test than companies that are held by investors directly um, and are bumping up against the limit and, and, and are in desperate need of capital. Now, with regard to those who need to be protected, will you be looking at, I mean, you said that you would you are concerned about them. But then going back to some questions that Mr. McHenry asked about who it is that is in need of protection, um, is that, I mean, do you all see that changing? I mean, in other words, is that something that you, is that a definition that you might want to revisit at some point? I am just curious. Well, the, the accredited investor definition was amended in Dodd-Frank right. to change the net worth test to eliminate the, the primary residence. And Dodd-Frank otherwise says that we are not to revise that definition, I believe, is for four years. Mm -hmm. And GAO is doing a study of, of the definition in the meantime. So I don't see that as a definition we are changing on the, on the immediate horizon, but it is a definition that does need to be a living, breathing definition as mm -hmm. investors change. For example, should there be a special accreditation for people who are um, chartered financial analysts who don't happen to have a lot of money for some reason, things like that. There might make, it might make sense to add people to the list. I see. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. You go back. I thank the ranking member. Uh, I have only one question for you as a quick follow-up. Uh, the, the current statute envisions that all investors are in one pool. So if a company has 
no program for their employees to own stock, no uh, any form of, of stock uh, options, they can have 500 street name investors, which could be thousands of actual investors through there. Well, if a company has 1,000 employees they want to offer, they have no choice but to, in fact, avail themselves of an alternative, because the same 500 applies regardless. Isn't that true? It is correct that the same 500 applies. I think that for some companies that are, that, that are traded in the over-the-counter markets, not on exchanges, they are held in street name, even though they are not reporting companies. Those companies could also have their employees hold in street name in theory. Um, those are not the kinds of companies we are really talking about at this hearing. I think the companies you are talking about are the companies that are pre-IPO companies who are growing um, organically. And, and for those companies, the employees being counted you know, certainly weighs into a, a, a meaningful cap. Okay. And, and that was a, just the point that I wanted to make sure we understood, that when we talk about protections, it is in fact not a fixed protection. It can be a very large number by comparison if employees are not offered, and a very small one if there are hundreds of employees in that mix. That is right. Thank you. And with that, I thank you for your participation in this panel and your patience uh, through all of it. And uh, we will take a five-minute recess to set up the second panel. Thank, thank you. you.